It is my privilege to welcome today one of India's most energetic and socially committed couples, Rohini and Nandan Nilakani. Um, in the work that we've done over the past several decades, whether it is entrepreneurial, philanthropic, or government-linked, Rohini and Nandan have touched the lives of millions of Indians in small ways and large. One thing that comes to mind, of course, is Aadhaar, uh, the Aadhaar card that many of us carry, most Indians have, and that is used widely in India for identity verification. Another thing that comes to mind is the generous giving pledge that Rohini and Nandan made in 2017 to give half their wealth to philanthropy. And it's not just their wealth that they've given so generously of, it's also their time to a whole range of community-focused projects. And then there's emphasis um, that put India on the global map for software solutions and services. And of course, we had um, we enjoyed the Infosys memes recently when uh, Rishi Sunak became the UK Prime Minister. Rohini and Nandan make a powerful team uh, working together on large-scale platform-led projects in areas like primary education at the national level and also supporting a number of think tanks and organizations that are working in the justice space. Uh, because of their work individually and jointly, they have a unique vantage position uh, where they can observe and influence some of the key forces that are changing uh, the India of the future. So the format for the sessions today, uh, we will have a one-on-one -on -one chat with Rohini, a moderated session. That will be followed by a one-on-one -on -one session with Nandan. And then we'll have them both on stage together. And there will be opportunities for audience interaction in both of these, uh, all of these sessions. Um, the, um, we plan to end at about 9 p.m. Uh, and then we will head outside for dinner and drinks. The moderator for the first session with Rohini is uh, Sonia Gupta. Sonia is an alum of IIM Ahmedabad. She is Managing Director Growth and Innovation for Growth Markets at Accenture. And before I invite, before I invite Rohini on stage, let me briefly introduce her to you. Rohini is a journalist, an author, and a social entrepreneur. She believes in the uh, power of an active and engaged community to hold to account markets and um, the government for public good. And this is a philosophy she's explored in her recent book, Samaj Sarkar Bazaar, A Citizen First Approach. Um, the organizers have uh, provided free copies of this book to all of you. Um, the um, foundations and the projects that Rohini has worked on have often been ambitious in scale. A book in every child's hand, that was a simple mission of Pratham Books, which she co-founded in 2004. And Pratham since then has reached uh, millions of children across India uh, with books in 21 languages. Step is a not-for-profit foundation set up by Rohini, co-founded by Rohini and Nandan in 2015. Um, it is um, a, a digital learning platform. And even at the time it was conceptualized, it was meant to bring learning opportunities to 200 million Indian children. So they certainly think big. And these are just two projects that I've mentioned. People who know Rohini have described her to me as outspoken and feisty and charming and down to earth. And so we look forward to hearing from you, Rohini, on your thoughts on the potential for an active citizenry, especially in a, a world of technological change. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rohini Nilakani. Okay, good evening and welcome everybody. Rohini, it's a delight to be here with you today. And after that very illustrious introduction, there is so much we want to speak to you about today. So perhaps to get us started, a little bit of a warm up. Uh, you've come after the new economy forum. It's been a heavy day for you, I'm sure. But we want to understand the person behind Rohini. Okay, so rapid fire questions. Um, just to get us started. This or that, and maybe a one word answer. Uh, indoor or outdoor? Outdoor. Social time with friends or me time? Social time. Books or movies? Books. Ah, favorite book? So many, but just now I just finished reading Amor Towles' Rules of Civility. 
I really recommend the author to everyone. I don't read, you know, everyone reads so less of fiction nowadays, but it, the book is described as agonizingly stylish, and I agree with that. Oh, nice. <laughs> agonizingly stylish. How lovely. Okay, since we've come out of a very hectic Diwali season and, you know, three years of pent up energy, chart or mithai? Chart, chart, chart. Oh, <laughs> okay. I didn't even need to ask you. Okay, lovely, lovely. Uh, the beach or the mountain? Beach. Where would we find you on the weekend? Um, with my grandson, ah. uh, who's going to be six soon and teaches me more than I can teach him because he's far gone ahead of me on knowledge about the things we both like, which is the wide world of nature. Ooh, what a lovely teacher to have. No, no, he's teaching <laughs> me. He taught me about bat-eared foxes. I didn't know they existed. Yeah, it's a bit scary what kids read nowadays. Okay, so maybe, you know, now that we've warmed up a bit, you've had an incredible journey, Rohini. You know, 30 years in civic engagement in a world that's fast changing. Um, if you look back, right, your first foray with, uh, what was it, uh, Nagarik, road safety, all the way through to Argyam, Ek Step, Pratham, Pratham books, to where you are today, right, with the Rohini Nilakani, Nilakani Philanthropy Foundation. What are some of the focus areas and what has brought you to this, you know, point today? You know, like all of us in this room, uh, while we didn't grow up rich, we still grew up very privileged. You know, we, my family was part of the urban middle class in Mumbai. And I, I feel like just being in Mumbai was a privilege because now when I think of it, in Mumbai, the, when I was growing up in the uh, 60s and 70s, uh, you know, we had clean running water, we had electricity, we actually had public transport, we had roads without potholes, yeah. uh, we had safety, we could go around in the, we had art, we had culture, we had the sea, we had everything now when I think back on it. And I think that itself was a privilege. And also as a bit of an activist do-gooder, which nobody likes, but I learned to uh, get a little more sophisticated about it. And so it was inevitable that I would become a journalist and then when I became accidentally wealthy, because Nandan became an accidental entrepreneur, <laughs> um, I found myself being a philanthropist. So then I could, um, you know, actually support all the hundreds of thousands of amazing social entrepreneurs we have in India. So that's pretty much the journey. But I'll add one more thing that um, in my family, mm -hmm. um, and in those days in India, I would say generally, because um, I'm pretty old and many of you are not even up to my age yet, <laughs> you'll get there. But we were always sort of the culture was service before self, mm -hmm. simple living, high thinking. My grandfather who went, who was the first uh, lot that went in 1917 to Champaran when Gandhiji called for uh, setting up an ashram there in the Indigo agitation, he was held as the biggest uh, person in the family to look up to. So those kind of values instilled in us is what I think got got me here. So what, what are the different areas that, you know, that the organization so, focuses on? You know, so we support a lot of things. I support a lot of things. Nandan and I support different things. And then finally, after, uh, after the, he lost the election and said, now what shall I do? We started working together in 2014. <laughs> and it's been quite a journey. <laughs> so... Um, but yeah, we support intellectual intra the intellectual infrastructure of India, mm -hmm. a lot of policy think tanks. Mm -hmm. I'm very passionately involved in environmental issues mm -hmm. and education has been at the very core. I also care about access to justice, mm -hmm. um, very important in a country like ours. And um, I'm very interested in active citizenship mm -hmm. and that's what I hope we'll talk about a bit yeah. more. So these are some of the areas. That's that we brilliant. support. All wicked, thorny, multifaceted, multi-stakeholder yeah, problems. Like nothing you, simple. That's why if you say, what did you achieve? <laughs> Most philanthropists cannot tell you what they achieved <laughs> because societal change is so extremely hard to bring about. And sometimes the problems lead to the, the solutions lead to the next set of problems. But you have to keep at it and keep at it and keep at it. You have to create evolvability in your approach. I love that. And you know, Rohini Ben definitely deserves a round of applause. What have you changed your mind about? Because it's been a journey. You started somewhere, you find it. What have you changed your mind about? I mean, I think one of the first things, by the way, I, we have not got these questions. I had some questions, but these are not what I read. <laughs> so 
evolvability rohini so you spoke about is, it something is going on here <laughs> but um yeah i think the first thing i changed my mind on was about wealth because as i said in the 60s and 70s when we grew up uh, we thought wealthy people were not exactly the world's best people okay i'm sorry i uh, that's what we used to think the country was a bit socialist and leftist and we thought wealthy people best stayed away from and then i suddenly found myself wealthy and i said oops <laughs> so then i decided that um it took me a while mm-hmm. but i changed my mind about wealthy people and wealth and the responsibility of wealth the other thing i got to change my mind uh, about because it's now 42 years i'm living with one man and i got to wow. change my mind about technology um because i i i study the liberal arts unlike many of you in iim and san iits but uh, and so uh, i was more interested in french literature and uh, poetry and a little bit of economics but was a little bit skeptical about the impact technology can have on the world but my god i've changed my mind thanks to <laughs> and i so hope nandan rich. will tell you why soon brilliant brilliant okay so let's maybe turn to this lovely book and you know you guys for those of you who haven't read it i had to speed read it as case material as part of this i will admit <laughs> uh, what a delightful read it's 15 years of writing clearly the journalist in you is you know doing very well in this book and all of your speeches the thing that stuck with me is really the title it's a very thoughtful title can you tell us a little more so samaj sarkar bazar is what i've been talking about for years now but i owe that that thinking the origin of that thinking to prem kumar varma one of our partners in my foundation argyam and we were on this road trip to bihar in the back of beyond really we were going towards khagadia from patna and that too at night which i'm not sure is the smartest thing to do but at that time he told us many stories including how um, you know there was a uh, massacre at a village and my friend asked so uh where was that is jahan pe hum ja rahe hain wahi pe hua tha so we felt even safer <laughs> and then uh on the way he also said, talked about how he felt and he belonged to he was a protege of uh, jp narayan who started the sampurna kranti revolution in india against corruption and uh, about peaceful development and he said pehle uh, uh, okay i'll say it in english he he said there seems to be a great imbalance in, in the world because earlier samaj or society used to be the foundational clearly more powerful sector even though there were monarchs they really didn't interfere too much in the life of the samaj and society but in the last 2 3 centuries especially since the industrial revolution um the bazaar or the markets became more and more powerful and he used the example of the east india company and then in the last century the state became incredibly powerful and when samaj and that way samaj got pushed back a little and he felt that was at the root of some of the problems that we were all facing and i found that a very powerful way of framing framing the question and i started doing a lot of research on my own and then started talking more writing more thinking more about samaj sarkar bazaar and that need for a better balance is what animates my work and philosophy so no matter which sector we work in the goal is how can you strengthen samaj how can you strengthen samaj to solve much of its own problems and by its through its moral leadership and through its institutions how can it hold sarkar and bazaar society i mean state and markets much more accountable to the wider public interest because sometimes we forget nowadays we get up in the morning and we open to amazon or we open to google and we immediately become customers even before we brush our teeth we are doing clicking on something and sometimes we see ourselves as subjects of the state rather than citizens of a society so is there something we need to change is there some mental model flip that we need to make that is my quest and it's really a quest i'm no expert i'm not an economist historian as a citizen i believe this and i think there's a dialogue that needs to be had um i think we have reached peak polarization mm. i think people are fed up of it yes. i think we can all learn to right. build bridges so that this discourse what is the role of samaj and society in this 21st century can be deepened across the aisle and uh, without cancelling anybody at all and Cancel. without any judgment at all <laughs> 
I get cancelled about a few times every day. I have two teenagers in the house. There's no navigating <laughs> this the right way. Uh, okay, so you talked to, uh, talked about active citizenship, the role of the rich. Tell us a little more with that anecdote in Bangalore and the floods. So I recently, I have been writing about how all of us actually, the elite, and in Singapore it's not true because Singapore is such a very highly developed society, but uh, and state also and market also. But in India, the elite, I just described this Mumbai of the 60s and 70s, but there's not that much of a difference between the rich and the middle class. But today's India, the elite have over the last four or five decades, and I'm including myself very much in that, um, have completely seceded from all public services, right? We have our own water, electricity, transport, um, everything you can, education, anything you can think of, we have seceded from the rest. We have separated from the rest. And that doesn't bode too well for a democracy at large. So I believe now the, I've called it the end of secession, because we know that you cannot secede from pandemics. You cannot secede from bad air quality. You cannot secede from floods. And so when the recent Bangalore floods happened, and many friends we know lost uh, you know, tens of crores of um, uh, their assets, and it was really shocking for them. And so many other slum people nearby also had all their assets washed away. Um, that's when I wrote about the responsibility of the 1% uh, to do a little more because this secession of the elite has resulted in castles being built on a very weak public foundation. So we, are, we have excellent private infrastructure, but what is it built on the back of, right? A, a not necessarily good foundation of public services. So can we, the elite, participate in some way or the other, and there's always scope to do a lot in India, so that that public foundation, whether it is a physical infra, digital infra, in any field whatsoever, is so strong that then on top of that, wealth creation leads to elite, fine. They can build their, their own uh, fortresses or palaces or what have you, but on top of the foundation that everyone can benefit from. That was the argument I was making. Okay, going off script again. You talk about physical and digital so much, yes. right? And you also spoke about the role of the rich and technology. Yeah. Can you elaborate just on the responsibility as we think about how Samaj reimagines cities and the societies we live in? Yeah, so uh, one of Nandan's abiding passions, okay, I, I'm not gonna take over his subject. <laughs> I have to restrain myself. We have to give him, let him speak. But we are very interested in urban governance and how cities should uh, develop in India. And we support a lot of organizations trying to do that work. Because in Bangalore, I tell you, we have the best samaj of urban reformers anywhere in the world. Every few inches, you can trip over one reformer. And they sometimes fight with each other, but sometimes work together. And many interesting, many of the most interesting ideas on reform across the sector come, I believe, from Bangalore as a proud Bangalore. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so that's an important thing. But also, um, uh, I think that the wealthy do have an extra responsibility in a country like India. And that right now, there is no backlash, great backlash against the wealthy in India as there is in many other parts of the world. And I think that's because India is still a growing economy. People are still very, very hopeful about their own future. Most of it, India comes at the top of optimism surveys all the time. And while people can believe that there is headroom for them to grow, uh, then, um, then they're optimistic and don't resent what's happening with the very unequal wealth creation that is happening around the world and in India. But that is why the wealthy have so much of a responsibility to make that base stronger. So whether it's about livable cities, whether it's about how people sometimes want to go, how are we going to reimagine our agricultural economy, right? Because urban, all of us urban denizens, and you know that very well in Singapore, are so dependent on other people's products and services, just as all urban people are all over the world. So it's a matter of great interest to us. So Rohini, you talk about the agricultural sector. And one of the phrases you used in the book really stuck with me. You talk about how the irony of it all, and you say how the the people with uh, the people that struggle the most with food are ironically the ones that are the producers of food in our country. Yeah. 
And while all of us know this instinctively, when it's put quite like that, it really stays with you. So tell us a little more about the agricultural, you know, the problems in, in that space. No, no, I'm not an, at all an expert on agriculture or food. I had written a couple of articles on it, but I would say that things have improved so much. I mean, in my childhood, we were still reading about hunger, starvation. Uh, today also, the pandemic has certainly put a lot of people back all over the world and in India too. But at least in South India, you will not find a single hungry soul. Um, and in much of the rest of India, there are of course going to be pockets. We have a long way to go. But in terms of, but we don't know what's going to happen next uh, because of climate change. Uh, food production patterns are going to change dramatically. And the government policies and the markets are going to have to keep up. So I won't, I'm not an expert, I won't give any further comments, except that all of us have to be worried about food, the production of food, the transportation of food, the, the energy and nutrition of food, not just for ourselves, but for all people around us too. And it's an endlessly fascinating topic. Absolutely. So everyone in, in the world today is a climate expert. And I say that with this, you know, with the heft of the topic, but also in a lighter note. What are some common misconceptions? So, um, I think in India, people are feeling the climate change effect quite directly on their lives. I mean, floods, we've had floods, we've had droughts, um, and uh, people, one disaster can change the lives, as we know, of tens of millions of people. I'm very happy to support organizations like Goonj, who are there right the minute something like that happens, and have a very revolutionary approach to helping the people get back on their feet. So people are feeling climate change, and I think they are will be open to a lot of policy shifts mm -hmm. that seem to have short that seem to have a lot of short-term trade-offs but they can see that they want their children's lives to be better. But um, I had the good fortune of bumping into an old friend called Adam Verbock recently. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. He was the youngest president of the Sierra Club, mm -hmm. and he was quite an environmental activist and actually helped to re-green many of uh, America's national parks. But then he began to understand that it's not enough to stand outside the uh, gates and agitate. And he started to understand that we have to work, especially with corporates, of course with government, but especially with corporations, if you're going to have a real serious impact on consumption and therefore emissions and climate change. Today he works with Amazon, mm -hmm. and they, he works on sustainability. And he, you know, there's been so much of gloom and doom talk over the last 30 years because governments simply haven't been able to move as fast as all of us want. Nor have we all moved fast, okay? We haven't particularly changed our lifestyle, but we like to tell government to move faster than the Samaj can because that's okay. But the best thing he told me was how companies like Amazon, for example, he said something I didn't know that Amazon uh, is 75% using renewable energy in its supply chain. And he said something that really made me think. We haven't yet realized that this is some humanity's most important task that humanity has ever taken up together to reverse 300 years of putting carbon into space. And he says, we don't think of it, but we are on the track. It's not yet visible, but we are on the track and I was telling him how grandparents always feel bad ki hamare grand grandchild ka life kaise hoga when we are gone, right? And he says, you know, I believe that in your grandson's life, around 2060, 2070, you will have less carbon in the air than we have today. He says so many good things are happening. And of course, that doesn't mean all of us can now pack up, go home and buy our next <laughs> uh, blingy thing like how I'm wearing, but that we have to keep at it, work at it, um, look at our own lives, look at uh, what we can support, what policy work we can support, what action we can support on the ground, so that Adam's predictions for my grandson's 60th birthday can come true. What a lovely, uplifting thought, right? So on that note, Rohini, let the journalist in you fly high. What question do you have for this group of overseas Indians? Yeah, so I'm very happy to my be in Singapore, and thank you all for coming here. Um, uh, so, I think I'm the warm-up act, but let's see what, what the rock star has to say. No, 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 but, not yet. But, it's what question? We're going to reverse the panel no, no, and ask this but group. So, I'm very happy to ask you questions. So, Singapore has very different issues uh, than, of course, India has. But from your perspective, 
what is the best way that you can give back to the mother country okay now your chance for all of you in the seats over there and i know you all do a lot we always want you to do more that's the problem dil mange more <laughs> so what can this samaj do yes. back for india i think you'll have to volunteer somebody yeah, yeah. no no i'm sure this is not a shy crowd yeah there yes Can Thank you introduce you. yourself? Yeah, your name, please. Uh, uh, my name is Tarun Mathur. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been based in Singapore for 17 years. I spent 18 years working in India. Um, did worked in technology, so engineering and then technology as background. But sometimes when I look back and I want to do things, I'm actually at a loss. I don't know where to contribute. I think I can contribute with knowledge. Uh, I don't think money is the issue. It's probably what you can do with that. So um, it's. where do i contribute what cause do i contribute because there are so many of them so frankly someone like me is actually lost i Thanks, do want sir. to do something i don't know what to do and i'm like okay. so I'll just be very candid and yeah, maybe they yeah. isn't bridgeable there exactly for that purpose shobha where are you <laughs> ah, so you just contact <laughs> him immediately yes and, and uh, kanoj we know where to find you <laughs> and by the way sir your money is also welcome we are <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. There okay. So many organizations that can go so far with a little extra funding, and especially if you give to those organizations. You know, I've I have found in my thirty years, if I start with trust, I end up with trust on all sides. Mm -hmm. So if you can just let go a little, and if you can give unrestricted support, it could mean any area of your choice, anything whatsoever. There are. Uh, civil society organizations working across the board but uh, with a little trust and with a lot of heart unrestricted support in an area that you are uh, like and um, shobha is going to give you a list of <laughs> organizations in any area you like to support and i'll help you with that thank you for that tanuj i think we have a uh, response here as well yeah so mine's um, the exact opposite of that i'm just so clear about what i exactly want but i'm just wondering if this is a good time to make a funding pitch to you oh <laughs> what do you think <laughs> <laughs> see we'll, uh, real people who really want to make a funding pitch never ask whether it's the right time <laughs> <laughs> so here we go here no. we go i think in the past you've supported anod governance am i right e gov e gov anod 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 the Oops. Maybe it's level. possible. Sometimes okay. I don't remember because there are literally dozens of organizations. And okay, so I think the the more generic one would be that I think we can contribute best by our expertise, mm -hmm. uh, because of course money is always welcome. But I think the most fulfilling uh, way to contribute is by our expertise. Uh, some of us have made some attempts to do that. Um, here uh, i i spent 5 years uh, in india after spending 10 years here um and 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 worked in the social sector and so on i think there are some um organizational capability strengthening institution building amongst the social sector yeah um here for example we get the opportunity to do that uh, with the national council for social service all right we're on several huge projects supporting several non-profits that are doing that um we have the expertise we just want to find a way to be able to do that viably in india yeah okay. i think there are now a lot of uh, intermediary institutions that have come up like isdm yes. and that would love to hear from some of you as to how you can give your time to uh, bring managerial expertise to especially to ngos that have ambitions to scale so thank you so scaling you What know anyone can ask me okay. questions either yeah i was going to say now we could probably <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Am I allowed to? Yeah. After you. Yeah. Go ahead. Deepa. Is it? Hello. Yeah. Hi, ma'am. Uh, we uh, we met outside. Yes. So I, yes, I just want to say that um, uh, my way of contributing has been to uh, work for uh, women who've taken a career break, and uh, uh, this is what our organization does. So Fantastic. women in India. Uh, what I do feel, of course, there is. We are just. uh scratching the tip of the iceberg and uh, um i do want us to do more for the girl child so uh, because that's where it all starts right so gender conditioning starts very early yeah. 
so i think uh, that's something it's it's like a vision or a dream we want to get there as well fantastic all the best just uh, just for your information unusually my gender portfolio is to do with young men and boys because i do believe that men are in crisis around the world especially young men and while there's obviously a lot to do for women's empowerment i think there's not been enough public policy orientation towards what's happening to young males and research after research and some of our own research is showing us how insecure they feel how nervous they feel how aggression is the only learned response some of them have how they don't have enough role models how they are nervous when they see their sisters girlfriends mm -hmm. even mothers sometimes having more career opportunities than they have they are getting confused and they need support and if we want gender equity if we want all genders to be working and living peacefully together i think the world needs to pay some careful attention to what's happening to young males Brilliant. so along with your work just something for you all to think a about a culture of equality brings both together can we switch now from the reverse panel to a question please can we get a set of questions for rohini what questions do we have there gosh so look at how many hands are up there's anand i think a few more i would expect nothing less from this audience <laughs> Suresh wanted to ask something. Yeah, Suresh. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, yes. good. Um, so on the first leg of Please this, introduce structure. yourself. It's always nice yeah. to have a okay. name. Okay, I'm Nimisha. Hi, I, Nimisha. Um, I'm an adjunct faculty at a university in Singapore. Wonderful. Uh, so I've just started this journey of uh, structured grant giving in India. I work in the field of autism, mm. so uh, to support the community of um, uh, people on the spectrum and their caregivers. So the biggest challenge, I think, is finding the right people as as others have pointed out and the problem i face is that there are many many there yeah. but if you see your organizations like um, yugantar and uh, mahila sanatkar that you support they are being supported by all the same big yeah. charities tata trust you call it the ford foundation azim prem ji all the same so how do you basically find untapped deserving beneficiaries and do you have a vetting process how do you make sure that they are the most deserving i mean for us sitting here in singapore yes i will be making frequent trips but how do i make sure yeah Thank so you. you have to go through the intermediary organizations like give india and there are going to be several more coming up dasra is there uh, we are just setting up something called um, accelerate indian giving um, so all these people are going to support and i've been asking some of them to focus on diaspora giving so hopefully all that will happen in the near future but you're right that the smaller organizations even for us it's very hard to find them uh, in uh, autism there's uh, in all these uh, spectrum disorders there's so much work to do that right now i wouldn't even worry about if you find an organization and if you feel even a semblance of comradeship with the person who is heading that organization just give a little amount and see what happens because i found even in the gender space when i started working on something nobody had supported before we started with one organization we have now landed up with 16 and more coming so you start somewhere don't worry about just start with any one organization and that will bring you the next and the next opportunities so just go for it there's Thanks no perfect so answer anyway okay i think there's a question back there Hi, uh, my name is Harsh Modi. I am I am B two thousand four. Um, I got lucky, got an I am. Uh, my younger brother he runs a startup in India, um, training teachers in primary for pre primary kids. Now he has been at it for a decade, but the problem he faces consistently is lot of graft at government level. anganwadi training teachers lot of people are unwilling to look at the social aspect as in at the implementation level and basically look at what's in for them now and this is a real world issue which and i've been really frustrated i've been working uh, uh, funding a startup for last decade so i know you have access but for people who are budding social entrepreneurs how do we cut across that implementation issues and really make a impact thanks um thank you i hear you i hear your frustration and i acknowledge it 
I'm just a little surprised that as a social entrepreneur, you encountered uh, your brother encountered graft, especially in that space. So offline, we'll need to know more. Just today, I met Aziz Gupta, a young uh, entrepreneur of rocket learning, who's really scaled up work with the zero to six age group, working with government, with the Ministry of Child Welfare, with the education departments. And we need, we need in India to really put a lot more effort into foundational learning because that's going to secure India's future of work, of livelihoods, et cetera. And in fact, he found everything to be going smoothly for him. I'm very sorry for that experience that you all have had, but I have not seen graft being an issue in this space. So something particular must have happened. I'll be happy to talk about it offline. Thanks for that, Rohini. Okay, so just shifting track, we'll come back to a few more questions in a minute. Balancing the personal and professional. It's obviously been a journey. What has your learning been in trying to balance the two? Uh, I think the main thing is, if you're, and I'm sure you all know this personally, that if your professional life and your personal life and interests are too divorced from each other, you can create unhappiness yeah. for yourself. So for at least for Nandan and me, our professional life and our private life, our personal life is not that separate. So we think about the same issues in our personal life and our professional life. So we've been very lucky that it's kind of seamless. Mm -hmm. Like it's not like the we Americans who separate that Monday to Friday and the weekend, mm -hmm. like things that will never meet. And that I think creates all the issues. So if you're, we are very privileged to be able to say it's that it's it's been aligned. But having said that, of course, in your there there is always the desire for the being alone with yourself, so that you can think mm -hmm. and then you can absorb the mysteries of the universe. So we do. We are lucky to get that time as well. I do that by disappearing into the forest. Mm -hmm. And during the pandemic, I was away for 80 days. Nandan was quite happy with this situation. <laughs> and um, I went, I would stay in Kabini, searching for the elusive Black Panther. Mm -hmm. And that was successful? At the end, yes, on December 18, 2020, after five years of searching for this Kariya, as he's called, I finally found him. How lovely, how lovely. Okay, so one, one more question. You have been um, recently awarded the most generous woman giver. Uh, with 120 crores in 21-22 alone. What defines your philosophy of giving? Um, see, it takes time to learn how to give well, as some of you already expressed, right? It's not so easy. Um, so uh, it was, it's been a bumpy journey. First, when I came into wealth for the first time, I came into wealth 100 crores, which at that time seemed like a mountain of money. And I decided to put it all into my foundation because I didn't think we needed it in our personal life. So when I got my first chunk of wealth, I just put it all into Argyam. And then, um, of course, uh, the way, as I said, the way the economy is structured, the wealthy make more wealth while they are sleeping than most entrepreneurs used to make in their whole lifetime. So we, then, we became more and more wealthy and I had to learn to give more and more away faster and faster. And so we became more ambitious and took more risk. Mm -hmm. and had more trust in people, mm -hmm. ideas, and institutions. And that's how it's been going on. That's the philosophy. Uh, trust in good ideas, good individuals, and good institutions. And let go of a little bit of control. Mm -hmm. And that's when you find the opportunities to give more. OK, that's very insightful. I, trust in ideas and institutions over time. OK. You talk a little bit about bazaar. And you know how important it is. You gave the Amazon example. We wake up and do the click, click, click. Can you elaborate a bit on what needs to change there so that Bazaar can actually help balance that equilibrium across Samaj, Sarkar, and Bazaar? So I think all of us know. See, we all wear, we all have multiple identities. But when you go to sleep, all those identities have to get stripped, and you are a human being first and a citizen next. And of course, you may be a father or a mother too. But I think we get sometimes confused about those identities in, the, in our day jobs. We forget how much at our core we are citizens when we go into our corporate selves. And I think that alignment has to be returned. And it's happening. Again, survey after survey says young people don't want to work for companies that don't have an expressed purpose to improve the world. And I think that change is very essential. So 
as I say sometimes in the book, and I often say that when even at especially in the bazaar, in your corporate avatars, there's so much change y'all can do for the better by making the smallest of differences. And if we have those conversations in the workplace, I think aligning uh, purpose and profit um, can happen better. But we have to wake up and think about it very deeply and not just at a surface level. And we know that capitalism has always evolved and tried to change based on the resistances it has found. And we are seeing that happen. We are seeing so much of conscious capitalism, stakeholder capitalism, all kinds of capitalism and nuances coming into the marketplace. And like Nick Stern said that climate change is actually market failure. And I think the market has woken up to that sense of failure and wants to find new opportunities in reversing that failure. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing I think all of us have to keep that conversation at the dinner table. It's not something you forget about when you come home from work. Absolutely. So keeping it active and being conscious about it. Okay, back to the floor. Couple of questions. There was a gentleman back there and I think there was someone in the, yeah. So I don't know who's handing out the mic. If I could just request you, please. I think we have a question back there and uh, here right in the middle as well. Uh, hi, uh, Azira here. Uh, till this evening, a bigger fan of your husband than you, but I promise to go back and read the book. Oh, <laughs> My question to you is on active citizenry. So we see quite a bit of people coming together in times of crisis. So whether it be the Kerala floods or whether it be the COVID crisis, you had entire... NRIs, Indians, educated people coming together, giving in money, giving in effort, intellect, etc. How do we see that panning out throughout the year to different causes? Yeah, no, it's an important question because it's easy to do something in a crisis and then forget about it. But um, as we see, you know, the short term and the long term is merging. So you're going to have everything seems to, crises seem to roll about. But I at least have had the great fortune to support dozens of young leaders who are pulling together young citizens of India to solve their own hyper-local problems. For example, Reap Benefit. And uh, they create something called Solve Ninjas. And there are 50,000 Solve Ninjas around the country who look at some local problem and activate citizens around them to solve some problem. It could be about water, it could be about some public infrastructure, it could be about education or fixing a school. There are all kinds of things that they do. Similarly, the, I can give you several examples. So I think people are actually putting a little part of their everyday time into this because it makes them feel very good. I've met many of those volunteers. It gives them great purpose and satisfaction. And it's part of belonging to a, a club of people like them. So it's moving from the once in a while to the everyday among a section of young people. And that's what we try to support. Also, retail giving in India has been growing by the leaps and bounds. 300 crores of money was given in just a short period during COVID by absolutely ordinary citizens who were not even used to giving that kind of money before. And today, there are a lot more people doing small giving through events like Dan Utsav, which is had from October 2nd to October 9th every year. So it's not just giving um, uh, their time, but also of their money um, on a routine basis. I, I think that's the best news I can give you all. Thank you for that question. I think we have a question back there. Is the mic not working? Do you want to just try speaking out loud? It's, I think we're in a small enough environment. See, I'm at the last bench and sitting in an orange chair, so I never made it to the IIM. <laughs> uh, but I'm part of another wonderful group called Dai. Yes. Right? Uh, so my question is actually a follow-up on that last uh, question. How do you monitor and look at compliance on the last mile? Because we can all give, but how do you ensure that it reaches the right level? Yeah. Are there processes in place? Are there... Uh, are there steps being taken to ensure that the money or the charity goes to the right person? Uh, so, in in my thirty years, I haven't encountered too much uh, too much fraud or wastage of money. We do simple due diligence, of course. I wouldn't just give to anybody, and nor would you. 
but with just simple diligence i think you can prevent i know you are far away so you feel that so you need a partner organization perhaps the intermediary yeah. organization they do a lot of diligence they mm -hmm. and because of technology coming in and because of government requiring a lot more um, uh, reporting and monitoring uh, feedback um, much of those old kind of practices have dwindled away. I so today the, I think yeah. you can be more confident. I think the point I was trying to make was in Singapore, when we give to charity, yeah. it's visible. Right? Yeah. You, you, can, uh, you can walk into a hospital right. and you know that you can utilize some of the benefits or the grants that the government gives or a charity organization. Gives. Right. Uh, I, I guess that's where I was coming from. In terms so of Gautam, visibility. if you were to give, say, scholarships or something, you could easily trace that. If you were to give to a building a hospital or a school or a bridge, you could easily trace that. My question is, how will you always be able to trace things that are invisible to define, invisible to measure, which are sometimes the most important things we need to do in a society? How will you measure agency of people that has changed from feeling hapless, helpless, hopeless to feeling capable of solving their own problems. There are no easy metrics for those kinds of things. But for the other things, sure. In Pratham books, we knew exactly. And by the way, uh, Vidya, it's not 21 languages. I retired from Pratham books and um, an even better team has taken over. And it's not 21 languages. The Story Weaver platform is open to the world. A hundred million reads have been had on the platform and it's in 303 languages because the people of the world have contributed. So, so that's easily trackable. And if you like metrics, then it's okay. You can give to things where you can easily trace every rupee that you put in because that kind of work is also happening at scale in India now. So Rohini, one final question. I'm conscious of time. What continues to excite you about the world we live in? I think uh, faith and hope are necessary things. Um, and uh, I get my hope and faith from the people that I meet in India. And oh God, that sounds like a terrible cliche. It sounds like <laughs> it's like the answer that Miss World, they say, How, what do you believe in? You're winning, you're winning, Rohini. <laughs> no, no, but, but honestly, I live also with a man who's an optimist quite sometimes irritatingly optimistic but um, I can s it's infectious mm. but what's most infectious is definitely definitely you go out into field you see people giving so much of themselves to change the world and you come back and say yeah I can do it too and there's no and then my grandchild for his sake I wake up wanting the world to be just a little better every day and then we have great teams and great people all around us. So we get motivated continuously. What a brilliantly uplifting close. Thank you, Rohini, for a wonderful conversation. Vibya? And now everyone has this delightful read, so please do read it. Nandan, you knew that was going to be a tough act to follow, right? So thanks for that very entertaining and stimulating session. Uh, before we go on to the next, I just wanted to make a quick plug. Uh, please follow our LinkedIn page. I am Alumni Singapore. Um, and uh, if you are an alum, you can also sign on uh, with your details on the site. Uh, the moderator for the next session is Suresh Shankar. Uh, he is the president, uh, I am Alumni Singapore. Suresh is an alum of IM Calcutta and he's founder and CEO of Crayon Data. Now to briefly introduce Nandan to you. Um, Nandan is one of the co-founders of Infosys Technologies. It was set up in 1981 when he was 26 years old. Um, he, um, over the, uh, the following decades uh, after it was set up, he held a number of roles in the company, uh, including CEO. He's currently the chairman of Infosys. In 2009, he became uh, the founding chairman of the Unique Identification Authority of India uh, to implement the massive Aadhaar biometric ID project. So Aadhaar, like many things in India are, is the world's largest biometric ID system. Uh, it is also laid the foundation of India's digital public infrastructure. 
And it isn't surprising that during the pandemic, India was able to set up a na national vaccination database. And unlike some other countries that are still issuing paper-based vaccine certificates, people vaccinated in India have access to digital vaccine certificates linked to their Aadhaar. Uh, Nandan also helped develop UPI, the Unified Payments Interface, uh, which is a mobile first real-time payment system that has truly enabled financial inclusion across the board in India. And he is now a force behind ONDC, the Open Network for Digital Commerce. Um, it is an open source e-commerce platform uh, that is aiming to level the playing field for smaller e-commerce players in India. And it is a revolutionary initiative uh, which threatens to break the monopoly of big tech companies. Nandan has received numerous awards uh, and uh, recognition uh, in India and abroad um, over the years. Uh, among these are the Padma Bhushan he received in 2006 from President APJ Abdul Kalam and the Doctor of Science that he received in 2019 from his alma mater, IIT Bombay. Nandan is also an author. His third book, which was released earlier this year, uh, is called The Art of Bitfulness, Keeping Calm in the Digital World. And it offers suggestions for people to live with technology and to uh, tune out the overwhelming noise of the internet. So India is poised at a very exciting time of technological change. And Nandan seems to be positioned at the heart of it, defining, conceptualizing, and building some of those transformative frameworks to support that change. So this promises to be an interesting session. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nandan Nilakani. And then before I start with you, Roni, that wasn't the warm-up act. That was the main course. Yeah, it tough, like tough act to follow. It is. So I'm going to actually use a phrase that I occurred to me as you're talking. And my first question to you is, behind every successful woman, there is a man. How does it feel to be the man behind Rohini? Great. It's great. It's. Uh, I need to retire now. Um, uh, first of all, Nandan, thank you for coming here. I know you have a busy week and you have to spend time in, in Rohini as well. So I'm going to start off with a rapid fire round of, uh, I don't think uh, we need too much of, you know, we've done the introduction, but I'll start off with a rapid fire round. You want off the cuff answers, you know, basically, which are your choices? So which one is your favorite? So Virat or Sachin? I don't watch cricket. <laughs> Badminton's your game? No. Tennis, tennis. Okay. Steve or Bill? Bill, Bill. Satya it's, or Sundar? That's a tough one. I know th both very well. And uh, I'll pass on that. <laughs> Would you rather be remembered for Infosys or Aadhaar? Again, it's both. The CEO job at Infosys or the chairman's job that you're doing now? Oh, chairman, it's much easier. <laughs> and Aadhaar, which you did, or ONDC, which you're going to do? Well, Aadhaar, I, mean, I spent five years of my life and had ten times when I thought it was all over, so Aadhaar. Which of these do you think is going to be the future? Crypto or UPI? Oh, UPI. <laughs> no doubt. Blockchain or Metaverse? Neither. <laughs> <laughs> I think after events of the last week, yeah, I mean, that one's... Um, startups, uh, which you're very passionate about, or large enterprise? Again... Both, but I, I feel excited about startups right now because many of them will become large guys who will change India or the world, yeah. Twitter or TikTok? Twitter, but only for broadcast. No engagement. Do you have the $8 blue tick? Um, he hasn't raised the bill yet, so uh, <laughs> I still have the tick. I maybe we'll take it away one of these days. And if you had to do only one thing, business or philanthropy? Oh, business, because... I enjoy business and philanthropy is a byproduct. Thank you for that uh, warm up session, if you will. Uh, I think uh, I don't really need to introduce Nandan, but what had occurred to me is that it's such an incredible journey, right? And you know, we celebrate entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs and Elon Musk who benefited consumers and created multiple revolutions. They've changed multiple industries. But there are not many people of whom we can say they've actually been the force behind three revolutions, all made in India. 
And Nandan's done that with Indian tech in his Infosys years, identity and you know with his other years, and now what he's probably going to do with commerce, the ONDC years. So I think uh, what's also amazing is that many of these have been movements and revolutions that have benefited society at large, not just the consumer or their own pocket. So uh, Nandan, let me start maybe on these three themes, your Infosys years and the whole IT model. Uh, for, in many ways, the IT services uh, revolution was a model T movement for the middle class of India. It, only, it not only created jobs, but it also created a consuming middle class. The world is now moving beyond everybody saying, you know, the builder revolution, product, SaaS, all of this. Uh, how relevant is this sector today to India's growth? No, I think the Indian IT sector absolutely has a lot of legs. And just to give you a sense of the scale change, it took 30 years for the industry to reach $100 billion. 30 years. It took 10 years to go from 100 billion to 200 billion. And it'll go to 200 to 300 billion in three years. So there's a massive step change in, in this thing. And I think COVID has led to digital acceleration. So I think uh, India will be the place. There's the only place in the world where half a million people are recruited every year and trained and deployed on technology. And it took 40 years to reach four and a half million people in the industry. It's going to double in the next 10 years. So you really, I think you actually, it's on the verge of a even bigger takeoff than the last. And every one job in the industry creates five other jobs. So it's been an engine of growth, an engine of middle class aspiration, uh, an engine of consumption. So I think absolutely it continues to be highly relevant. And it's also given India the foreign exchange. You know, today India has reserves of $500 billion precisely for two reasons. One is the IT industry, which is $227 billion in size. And because of remittances from people abroad like you, and that's an $86 industry. So it's because of that that while a lot of countries in the world are going through, you know, currency issues, India is strong because of these industries. And it's about it used to be about eight percent of GDP. It's still going to continue. Yeah, to be yeah. That I, think, I think it'll probably go up to more like ten percent of GDP. So it's not just an industry of the elite anymore. Or the few middle no, class. No, I think it's it's uh, it's it really it's it's important. It also has given the human capital to do the other revolutions, right? I mean, whether it's a startup revolution or the digital public goods. Finally, it came down to because there were millions of people with the right skills and willingness to work on these things. And as we're seeing all these new trends that are emerging in the world, right? Everybody is saying this, you know, that AI and blockchain and metaverse and all these new things that are happening. Is the industry also poised to actually ride those trends or are we like still the... I mean, are we still the back office of the world? No, 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 no. The work being done is extremely sophisticated. I think we're solving some of the world's most complex uh, problems for the world's largest countries and companies. So I think it's very, very sophisticated. Just this morning, I had two meetings which are very, you know, about stuff that were really big change. So I think uh, it's, it's really even bigger than ever before. And, you know, I think also there's, because of the learnability and agility, if there is a new trend, then I think the ability of, firms in India to adopt and leverage that trend is very high. And uh, so you think that uh, we're going to get, like, you know, we don't actually, we've now starting to see product companies come out of India and startups coming out of that. But you think that trend is going to accelerate in the next yeah. few years? I mean, there's a lot of startups that are coming out of no, 100 unicorns. No, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, in 2016, uh, there were 1,000 startups. Today, there are 90,000 startups. And, you know, when I go for a walk in Bangalore, at least three people stop me for angel investing. So clearly there's something, something in the air which is happening. And, you know, if you go back and look at the IIT JE topper in 2012, he wanted to be a scientist. The IIT 2021 topper wants to be Elon Musk. There's a fundamental change uh, in people's attitudes. More and more young people want to be entrepreneurs. And uh, I think uh, they're all amazing, ambitious, thinking big very tech savvy, very business savvy. So, you know, out of 90,000, even if a few thousand do well, th that they get the needle. So I think it's a very good time for entrepreneurship. Clearly, there's right now a bit of this funding winter and all that. But fundamentally, it's on a good wicket. And you talk a lot about these serendipitous collisions that occur uh, in this industry. I mean, could you give us a few examples and share some of your own? No, I mean, uh, I, 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 I have a picture of uh, entry into a brewery in Bangalore and it's about a party parties that you know says which you know they're coming for a party says this way to the Accenture party that way to the Udan party this way to some other party so you know there are some four or five parties on a single night which are all different technology companies so that's the kind of uh, things are happening so there's 
There are the coffee shops full of young entrepreneurs, the VCs are floating around. So it's quite an interesting uh, phenomenon. And we are seeing newer generations of companies because, uh, you know, the earlier companies spend a lot in customer acquisition. They would spend on advertising on Google or Facebook and, you know, burn a lot of VC money. But now people have become creators. They're creating their own YouTube or TikTok kind of channels. They're attracting millions of viewers. It's free customer acquisition. And then they're upselling to them. So we're seeing a lot of very interesting, probably much more sustainable business models today uh, than even five years back. That's interesting. I think I want to go on to the second theme, and you know, I'm sure the audience, I don't want to kind of leave some time for that. You left corporate life, which is at a very young age in some ways, yeah. right? To go in and create this idea of devoting your life to what you call the digital public good. And what was your thinking at that time when you said, I've done this thing in Infosys, and now I'm going to go and do something larger? Well, you know, I've always been a junkie on impact. So I thought here was a chance to do something which potentially could change things, but could also potentially flame out. I mean, it was a high risk uh, effort because I was going from Bangalore to Delhi. I was going from my con office overlooking a golf course to uh, sort of a office inside somebody's office. I was doing a startup in a government with no stock options. So fundamentally, it was a very different world for me. Uh, and uh, I, of course, I, I, I had a very good alibi. I said, if I succeed, I'll, it's a good thing. If I fail, I'll just say that you know, I couldn't deal with the system or the system failed me. And there were enough reasons I could give. So I was well covered on, on both sides. Uh, and it was, uh, so I think that's what drove me to do it. And then, of course, that made me think more and more. So I became an advisor to NPCI. We did the UPI stuff. So, so over the last 13 years, it's really been one after another. Now we have a playbook on how to do these complex uh, things. Most important thing is nobody should know what you're doing so that, uh, you know, before you know it, it happens. And what were the biggest challenges you faced at that time? Was it like, uh, I know the high commissioner is here, but uh, he makes me really good. Is it the bureaucracy? The politicians, is it something else, and what is the mindset? Well, it's, no, it, it's a, it is a very complex scenario. You see, the, I'll tell you what's different for someone who's been a business guy and a government person, right? A business, by and large, you have rules of the game, right? When you run a company, you know, you, you're, whether you're running a software company or a, a shoe company, you're basically about growing revenue, growing profits, improving efficiency, increasing earnings per share, market cap, ESOP, all that. It's a, it's the game is well known. The, so there's one goal. So business guys, by and large, have one set of goals, no matter what. Public life is absolutely like, it can go anywhere. Because there are different people with different views, different ideologies, which is why you have gridlock in many countries. So when you have a much more complex, open public system, to get anything done requires a whole new level of uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, consensus building. So for example, when I did the ADA project, I went to every state. And I met the chief minister and I met the uh, bureaucrats and told them what's coming and sort of built a climate of opinion for this project. And I went to states across political lines. So I wanted to make it you know, multi-partisan in that sense. And I had to deal with bureau politicians, bureaucrats, uh, judges, lawyers, activists, journalists, you name it. So, and then the, also the other lesson I learned, do this kind of public change, you should do minimal invasive surgery in a sense don't go with some big thing because it they know so go with something which is very uh, light and just you can just make a quick incision then you can grow it so but we made other wasn't that it was a massive no no it was very simple it was you get a id that says you who are, you are you who you are and for example when i first started uh, when i would go to the mr kumaran's ministry the mea They'll say, why do you need an Aadhaar? We have a passport, you know. Then I went to the guys who did the tax. They said, you need Aadhaar, you have a PAN number. So, you know, everybody is like turf, right? So I said, no, this is not, this only says that Ashok is Ashok. Whether Ashok deserves a passport, you deserve a tax guy. This says, you know, Mohammed is Mohammed, but whether Mohammed deserves a passport, uh, deserves a tax ID, you decide. Oh, then he said, then it's fine. So as long as you are not taking away 
not taking in in a, in a bureaucratic system as long as you don't take away somebody's power and authority, it's fine. So we deliberately underplayed it, saying we are just an ID that says John is John, and how you think of John is up to your rules. So then we solved that issue, and similarly we kept it information as simple as possible, which again is counterintuitive because everybody says, "Oh, we're going to go to a billion people, collect everything about them." I said, "No, we're not going to do anything. We're going to only." Name, address, date of birth, sex, email ID, phone number, and biometrics. So I would go to a meeting with the health ministry and say, why don't you collect the blood group while you're doing this? I would go to some other guy and say, why don't you collect the caste when you're doing this? I said, no, pal, we're not doing any of that stuff. We're just going to be simplistic. So sim sim minimalism is a counterintuitive thing. It, it is very, very simple to insert into a complex fabric. And you, it also survived a political transition. That's right, yeah. And that was difficult? Yeah, it was difficult because actually I lost the election also in the middle of all that. So, we'll come to that. We'll come to that. No, no. So if you want to see the full lifeline of this, I joined the government in the UPA in 2009 when Manmohan, Prime Minister was Manmohan Singh, and he was very, I mean, the whole, they were all very gracious to me. And they let me do my job. I'm not sure they knew what I was doing, but they said, okay, this guy seemed to know what he's doing, let him do his job. So I, I managed and I committed publicly to 600 million Aadhaas in five years. So I reached that in, uh, in, 2020, uh, in March 2014. So I, so I quit and then I stood for election, then I lost the election and then uh, Prime Minister Modi came and then I, I started getting you know murmurs that this project may get canned and all that. So I got a bit nervous and then Rohini said, why don't you go and meet him? Uh, so we had gone to Delhi, at, we had to give up a house Usually people don't give up their Delhi houses, but I did. <laughs> so they hang on to them for years. So I went and then I asked for a meeting and he was very gracious and gave me a meeting within 24 hours at a time of my choice. And he gave me half an hour and he had, he knew exactly what it was and he, he was very supportive. And so then he, uh, well, he's always been very technology oriented. So he, he fully got it. Because I'd met him earlier in uh, Gujarat to get him to adopt Aadhaar in Gujarat, so he, I had some background. So I think I was able to handle the government uh, transition and even the name Aadhaar was, I, I wanted to make sure it was not named after any person because then you know then again, it, so I said Aadhaar is neutral, like it just says foundation. So we did a lot of market research and found that Aadhaar was acceptable in most Indian languages and it was a neutral word. So you know, you think all these strategic things uh, when you're looking at you know, government transitions and all that. Did you in your, when you went, did you ever think that you would become simply one of the most successful technology projects and country transformation level initiatives that it has become? No, we had, I mean, we had a vague idea of what we were trying to do. And I must tell you that the managing the navigation of politics is more complex than the technology. The technology is very complex. So it is, you know, managing all this through all this system is much more difficult. But I think we had an idea, and if you go back and look at our original design documents, which we wrote in August of 2009, they're still valid. Whatever we said we said we'll do, we did it, and it worked. Uh, but I think the scale of usage, we, I didn't realize, you know, 50 million authentications a day, 5 million KYCs a day, $210 billion transferred in direct benefit transfer. These are serious numbers. So I think that, the fact it will reach this scale, I, I don't think we, we visualized it. And moving on to this third thing, I mean, now you have been you know, on top of other, you had, I mean, the India SAC has come, you had UPI, you're now doing the ONDC. Um, why are you like looking at ONDC? Because again, it's a very different way of looking at commerce. Yeah. I think to. And I be, think maybe yeah. it's a less understood thing than other, yeah. which we all experience. So. Yeah, before uh, ONDC, let me talk about some other steps, right? So, first we did other. 1.3 billion people, digital ID, online authentication, KYC. KYC allowed you to open a bank account or get a mobile connection. In fact, one of the big users was Geo. When they launched their mobile network, they used Aadhaar KYC to ramp up to 100 million customers in six months because they could do a KYC in two minutes. So that then we did the DBT, government the DBT, and used the DBT successfully, for example, in the pandemic. Then I became an advisor to NPCI. And in 2013, we had our first meeting on how do we design a next generation payment system. And that was launched in uh, May of 2016. Uh, by, at that time, an IIM graduate was a governor of the Reserve Bank. 
Raghuram Rajan. So Raghu was very supportive. And then in October 2016, we reached 100,000. The moment I was worried, the way you said, I am graduate, I was thinking he doesn't like us. But no, no, I'm giving, I'm saying I am gathered everywhere. So, uh, including, in the, including in the central bank. So, Raghu was very, very supportive. And then October 2016, we reached 100,000 transactions. And then November 8, 2016, we had the whole withdrawal of currency notes and all that. Also, the rate Trump won the election. Yeah, but... Trump was not a factor in this one. Uh, so sometime towards the end of November, the government felt that we need to have a digital payment system. And fortunately, this stuff was already there. And then the Prime Minister himself adopted it. And he launched an app called Beam in December of 2016. And the government put the full force of its might behind uh, payments. And uh, then, of course, the pandemic further, because it was all contactless. So you could make payments without meeting anyone remotely. So today it does 7.3 billion transactions a month, and it's a massive uh, payment system. 260 million people use it, and uh, about 50 million merchants accept payments using UPI QR codes. To give you a sense of the scale, there, but it took 70 years to have 6 million POS machines, and it took 3 years to get 60, 50 to 60 million QR codes. So that's the scale of change that happened. So then we built a third thing, which is we said if we can create digital payments and that creates digital transaction data. Now, is there a way to think about data as something that people can use? And this is based on our principle, uh, which is that Indians, and it's true of many countries, Indians will be data rich before they're economically rich. This is an important point. Because a guy using a smartphone in Bihar, his digital exhaust or digital footprint is the same as a guy using a smartphone in Boston, except the guy in Boston has a $60,000 a year income and the guy in Bihar has you know, $1,500. Now, in the Western world, when a smartphone is used, then that data is valuable to sell things to him, right? So you do advertising, and it's a $300 billion industry, digital advertising to a user. But if you flip it around, if it's a person who's at $1,500 and you want to increase his income, can that, that, that data be useful to him? So we have flipped the whole argument around, saying instead of data being useful only to companies and to governments, can data be used by every individual? And we call that as data empowerment. And that's also been, and the Reserve Bank of India has been a big supporter of data empowerment. They've been fantastic at this. And today, it's, that's been rolled out. What that means is that individuals and businesses can use data to improve their business. And specifically, the first use case is credit. So uh, small individuals and businesses can use a digital record to get credit. And, we, and for that, and typically credit is given to people who have assets, right, physical assets. But then that favors incumbents. Yep. Uh, this is people giving loans to people who have information assets. So we call it as information collateral. And that's challenges because they don't have anything else, but they have the data of the yep. business performance. And that's rolling out a couple of million transactions have happened. So that will give access to credit. So then we said, if small businesses get access to credit, how do they get access to markets? And that's how the ONDC thing came about. And ONDC, by the way, it's, it's really an idea that's been strongly promoted by the government, by the Minister of Commerce, Mr. Piyush Goel. He's, he's fantastic bureaucrat. So it's really, you know, it's, I'm just one more person in that. I'm not the main guy in any way. But it's, it's, but it's very interesting because there again what you're trying to say, even with UPI I think this happened, is that you're not actually substituting the role of business, you're creating the rails and That's the right. roads for people to run. Yeah. So in a way you're democratizing access to yeah. much yeah. So UPI we said any bank account to any bank account, any consumer app to any consumer app. So I could be using, I could be having an account in you know, SB, State Bank of India using a uh, phone pay app and you could be having an account in HDFC bank and using uh, you know Paytm and we can transact seamlessly. So that was the whole vision. The idea being that rather than payments being a, a, a choke point, payments would be liberating and you know the everybody could participate. So that was the whole idea. And market and innovation competition would drive it rather than, you know. Uh, and and ONDC knows. ONDC is the same thing for commerce, which is saying that rather than dealing with one platform that does everything, I could order on one buyer app. The seller could be anyone listed in the ONDC catalog. And the delivery could be done by anyone who is logistically compliant with ONDC rules. 
So what that does is that it completely democratizes access. So any supplier who has a product, if he follows ONDC protocol and lists his product, anyone can buy it from any app. So he gets the whole market. And any consumer app can provide a very good solution for the buyer. And there are many, many companies that are specialized in logistics that are coming. And very importantly, it's very important for hyperlocal commerce. So if, for example, if I want to, if I want to buy a very expensive consumer durable, I may still buy it on a, on a regular platform. But if I want to pick up a few groceries from my neighborhood store, I'd rather do it through ONDC. So the idea is, if every small retailer can be onboarded, then that becomes massively inclusive. So I think when you look at these revolutions, what's fascinating is uh, you pretty much started the Aadhaar, which is the start of this thing in 2009. It looks like, let's say in 2026, 2027, as it rolls out, in about 16 or 17 years, India would have created a completely different model of growth led by technology. And isn't that like, um, and I don't know what to say apart from saying it's amazing, but isn't that a model for the world, especially, not just a model for the world, but a developing world, I mean, where developed world where none of this stuff exists, I mean, but like, you know, other areas, Africa, Latin America, etc. Yeah, I, th I think so. I think, I think it took the pandemic and recent events uh, the uh, to realize the value of this. For example, uh, during the pandemic, Many countries struggled with sending money to their vulnerable people, whereas we were able to do it electronically in real time through a few hundred million bank accounts, right? So that showed the power of this infrastructure to deal with how to get vulnerable people to get access to you know, emergency fi financing. And now you're seeing the energy crisis, uh, for example, uh, in the West. Uh, after a long time, they started giving energy subsidies. The price of energy is so high. but they don't know how to give the subsidies, and therefore they give it in a broad brush way. Mm -hmm. So everybody gets the subsidy, right? So if you see the big subsidies, $200 billion, Euros, 200 billion euro subsidy coming in Germany and in UK also. Yeah. So because they don't have the infrastructure, whereas in India you can actually say energy subsidy will only go to the poor. So then you, know, it's, you need these kind of events to demonstrate the value of this plumbing. So I think people are beginning to get that. Plumbing has huge strategic value. And, and NPCA has this uh, charter of going out and selling this to the world. But why? I mean, isn't the soft power as well as economic power globally if you can get this model out? No, I, th I think India is, uh, has soft power. And I think uh, you know the Prime Minister completely understands this. India is now going to be the G20 uh, president for the next one year, starting on December 1st. In fact, this meeting happening right now in, in Bali is the transition point. And one of the big things will be how to take India's digital public goods global, whether it's Aadhaar or UPI or account aggregator or ONDC or education. We got a whole host of things. So I think it's very much part of the, and sure we have a Kumaran here, he, he can tell us more about what the diplomats think about all this. And uh, I'll just leave a couple of questions before we go to the audience. Um, so when you look at what you've done out here, What's next? I mean, there are a couple of sectors that need this revolution, healthcare, education, et cetera. Is that yeah, your actually, uh, what's next for you? In healthcare, there's already a move to create uh, interoperable electronic health records. And uh, there's a group called NHA, National Health Authority, whose CEO happened to be my partner in UIDAI. So he was, uh, the, he was the, like I was the chairman kind of guy. I prefer the job of chairman, as you can see. And he was the CEO actually make, getting things done. Uh, Ram Sevak Sharma. And he's leading the health effort. And we just had a meeting last week in Bangalore on, on the health stack and how to make it you know, much more interoperable. And on education, a lot of what we did at XTEP is actually being used now uh, across the country. Uh, millions of teachers are using that tech. So there's both on health and education, there's a lot of uh, activity happening. So the fundamental idea is, can you transform a society by digitally enabling it in an equitable manner? I mean, it's the headline thing. Because if you can get a billion people to have identity, bank accounts, payments, loans, health, education, jobs, skills, in a tech-enabled manner, then you'll accelerate change. What, what can we say? Uh, I'm just going to, uh, I mean, the only, the only thing I can say in terms of entertainment is the other memes, the UPI memes, you know that, uh, Everybody who's going around there with the bull and all that has a UPI code that you can scan. It's, it's like fantastic. 
but uh, a couple of things uh, are I think more relevant for some of us, right? I think as technology is changing things, there are I think a bunch of different types of professions out here, young people, mid-career professionals saying, hey, what do I do, etc. How would you ask people to look at their careers today, no matter whether you're young or mid-career or you're an old guy like me trying to say, hey, how do I stay? You're relevant? younger than me, so. How do you, how, how do you stay relevant? in this age when technology defines everything, when business models are changing, everything is changing around us. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a continuous learning journey. I mean, I think even today I read three, four hours a day, and and of course I meet people, connect the dots, have conversations. I see every meeting with a client as a way to learn something about his business. So I think if you remain insatiably curious and in a learning mode, then you can keep on top of things. The other thing is separating the uh, noise from the you know signal. And that's why if, if you see my book, it's all about don't get caught in WhatsApp forwards every morning. I mean, you know, that, that you're sort of digressing, you're sort of missing the point. So I try to keep noise in my system out and I try to just extract the signals from everything that I see. So if you do that, I think it can be uh, relevant. And one thing I must tell you that uh, when we did all these projects, we got a great bunch of volunteers from around the world. So, you know, uh, we had uh, my a friend called Raj Mashruwala who went to IIT with me. Uh, he very successful entrepreneur in, in the valley. And he just packed his bag one day in 2009 and came to Bangalore and stayed in a small apartment and helped us with Aadhaar. You know, and, and many people like that. Uh, so, uh, so I think we were able to attract all kinds of diverse people and bring them. To, and that was, by the way, the biggest challenge I had. How do I bring people from different backgrounds, some of them were government bureaucrats who had a certain view of the world, uh, technologists from, you know, short wearing technologists from Silicon Valley who had a different view of the world. How to get these disparate guys, men and women, and blend them into a team, a high performance team to do one thing. That was actually the most difficult part. Uh, we have a lot of, I'm going to ask one last question. We have a lot of people from FinTech out here. Uh, Sopnindu is the Chief FinTech Officer of MAS. Elavandi, who's been promoted by is actually also a sponsor. And uh, one of the things that Singapore has done very well over the last few years is create this huge FinTech movement, the largest FinTech festival in the world. By the way, last week your co-founder Chris was here. I introduced him to Sopnindu and Sopnindu, I said, oh, he runs the largest FinTech festival. And Chris said, oh, we're going to beat you. India's going to look bigger next year. But, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, the whole fintech space, which is something that is very critical to Singapore, and I think a lot of people here are from that space. Any thoughts on where this is headed? And uh, Yeah, I, no, I think I think number of things. I mean, one is, of course, uh, access is becoming ubiquitous, right? Everybody will have a phone, a smartphone of some kind. Everybody will have a bank account. Everybody can do an instant KYC and open a bank account. Payments will become, you know, whether it's pay now or UPI, you'll be able to do instant payments. Data or information collateral is just beginning. The notion that you can use a digital footprint to get access to credit or access to wealth management services is just at the beginning. And then I think it's going to lead to not just in banking, but in insurance, pensions, uh, you know, mutual funds, SIPs. The whole thing will be all tech enabled. I mean, like in India today, a big thing is SIPs, systemic investment plans. Uh, and that's because we have this recurring mandates like auto pay on UPI. So I can just set up an auto pay and then on my phone and say, okay, every every month deduct thousand rupees from a bank account and put it into a mutual fund, and that generates uh, you know billions of dollars of money into India's primary markets. So I think the whole financial thing, the deepening of it, the access, the use of data, I think it's it's heading for a huge thing. And I think Supendra has been at the forefront of that here. I've been you know talking to him and working with him for several years now. What five six years we've been to, talking. But there seems to be two different waves out here, right? A lot of what you're talking about is the democratization of fintech and making it accessible to everybody. And then there's this frothy, I mean, I'm not going to say crypto alone, we know you're with that, but that whole stuff that's happening at the top of just crypto is going to be like, you know, these different kinds of things that will change the way decentralized finance. We know your views on the democratization. What's your view on that frothy stuff at the top? Well, I think, essentially, I think the last 10 years of, uh, and I may get into trouble with somebody here, so. Last 10 years of this heavy, easy liquidity, zero interest rate, we not only saw asset bubbles and all that stuff, we also saw technology bubbles, right? So a huge amount of money has gone into crypto. Of course, they also made money by selling uh, cryptocurrencies, tokens. But, you know, India, the world has spent $100 billion on uh, autonomous cars. 
uh, they spend another billions of dollars on metaverse and all that, which I don't know where all that's going and maybe some of it. But my view is that if I can think about what is it that will make a difference to people's lives, then it sort of anchors the work you do. So I tend to not get swayed by AI, though, I think is for real. I, mean, I think AI is for real. And I think AI we can use in a big way in, in these kind of things, too. But the other stuff appears quite frothy to me. A personal question to end the last one. You lost the election. You had a career that was only like this. And then you had that moment. What happened? What was it like? Yeah, How well, the, first of all, why did I stand for election? That you have to start from there. I stood for election because I thought if I want to be a change agent, then I need to have you know political whatever, capability to get it done. And so I stood for election. But the underlying thing was hubris. Because, you know, I had been a very successful entrepreneur. And then I had gone into government and done this Aadhaar business. So I thought I was like God's gift to mankind or something. Ernie, we'll ask you about this later. So I said, OK, I can run a company, make a company successful. I can do some complex project. I can win. What's the big deal in the election and all that? And then it is a completely different game, not my game. So it was uh, what in the internet world is called fast fail, right? So I did a fast fail. I tried for three months and realized this is not my cup of tea. And then I was jobless because I didn't have a job in the government. I didn't have a job in forces. I didn't have a job in politics. And that's when uh, I asked her, what should I do next? And uh, she also knows that I have a penchant for trying to solve big problems. So she said, uh, so she said, why don't you do something in education? We can do it together. I said, are you sure we can work together? I said, yeah, we'll figure it out. Then I said, how big is the problem? He said, 200 million kids. I said, OK, this is a good one. <laughs> so that's how I, we did X step together. So I think it was a traumatic experience to lose an election because an election loss is a very public repudiation of who you are. Right? It's like a collective rejection by a few hundred, you know, million people. Right? So it's not easy, not easy to do. And I was definitely uh, you know, de depressed or demotivated for some time. And then I said, Let's get back into the game. And that's how I got back. And now I feel I'm back. <laughs> Thank you for your authenticity on that. Uh, we're going to take a few questions to the audience, and then we'll have Rohini and uh, Punya back on stage for a thing. But any questions from the audience very quickly? Uh, I'm going to go left to right. I'm a leftist. Your father was a Fabian socialist, right? Your... My father was a. Yeah, socialist. My uncle was an atheist. So, M. And Royce. Note here, if you look at his co-founder, even he started off as a socialist. So if you start as a socialist, you can become a capitalist. <laughs> but anybody on the left? Uh, the lady in the front here. Why don't you try this one? Hello. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Hi, Nandan. Lovely to see you. And thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. So, um, I will assume that, well, I know for a fact, because I've seen stacks of books behind you when I've interviewed you previously, uh, that you read a lot. You said yourself that you read three, four hours a day. You also mentioned the 200 million children that you want to help with education. If those 200 million children were to say, what is the one book you recommend that we must read before we hit 18, what would that book be? As a kid, it'll be one of Rowney's books. <laughs> Uh, but but I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I've uh, actually I read less books. I think I read all other junk, but less books. But I was shaped when my youth on with you know J D Salinger and stuff like that. But I don't know whether that's valid for these these kids. Thanks. Thank you. And then uh, Prime Minister Modi came to Singapore in 2018, and he came and spoke at NTU, where I work. He was very keen for NTU to partner with India. And we are amongst friends here, so I would say that we, while we have a lot of students coming from India, from the IITs and Indian Institute of Science, we're having a bit of a challenge trying to get Singapore students to go to India. And given that you know it's so exciting, we all understand it's a very exciting ecosystem here. What are some of the synergies that you see, or what can Singapore students get when they travel to India, either in the startup system or in the academic world? 
how do we excite yeah. Singapore? Because they're very able and very competent, and it's just a matter of you know exposure. Well, I, uh, are you looking for uh, short-term kind of things, or uh, you mean? Yeah, short-term immersion. Yeah. Well, actually, I think there are many, many exciting projects which they can get involved with. I mean, when we had at Aadhaar, for example, we had a program and uh, we got people from all the top U.S. universities uh, to come and uh, they, they actually did projects with us. We have some now in Step. At Infosys, we have the uh, InStep program, which, which is one of the world's best internship we get students from around the world so i think if it's stuck it has to be structured well you have to find the right partner for it and then you can build the, uh, the, the path i think thank you is there a question in the center from other hi nandan fascinating to hear you uh, you spoke about signal to noise ratio and clearly that showed your engineering background and i think that connects to a very important uh, idea or revelation that we all begin to uh, realize, which is time is the most important currency that we have. Because if we have time, and if we make time, we can actually you know, uh, direct it towards things that make a difference. I heard an interview that you gave earlier this year, where you, the lady asked you, what are your hacks for how do you actually make time? And something stayed with me, which I've been trying to implement in my life, which is you said that uh, when I'm on my iPad, it means I'm reading I'm assimilating information when I'm on my computer then people know that I'm actually working and creating and when I'm on my phone it's definitely not for whatsapp and all these revenge and emotions and you know looking at forwards I'm actually communicating with people it must have taken you some time to get to that place where you begin realize this is how I can make time yeah can you share with us yeah. that how did you get there and no I just stumbled on it I mean I think uh, uh, you know I mean, we all, our generation grew up with laptops as a first. So email was a natural thing and work. So I sit at a table with a laptop, I know I'm going to work. I don't have anything else. And then uh, I think because of reading and all that, an iPad is just a better thing. And I, there, I think more than what I do, it's what I don't do. I don't do WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, or Snap. Snap. Okay. So that's out. I do Twitter only to send a message. I don't get into Twitter fights. I'm not into all that stuff. And I don't follow cricket. I don't follow politics. I don't follow Bollywood. Now, when you remove these things, you can imagine how much time I have. <laughs> it's about what you don't do. And then I have another hack, which is no negativity. I don't spend my time feeling bad or jealous or saying, why did you do better than me or none of that shit. I get up in the morning and say, what, I, what value can I add this morning? There's somebody else in this. You know, there are some couple of questions in the center row there, and then Rahul, and then there's a person behind. And then there are two more at the back. Hey, back row guys. Let's go here first. I prefer back row guys, actually. Okay, you get, you'll get your tasks. Good evening. Good evening, Nandan. Uh, this is Nick Hill. Uh, uh, it's, it's amazing to see the kind of digital revolution. Um, I just spent last week in uh, India, and uh, I, I was not able to spend the $1,000, 1,000 rupees that I withdraw because even the, uh, uh, the vendors, uh, even the uh, smallest of the vendors are accepting UPI payments. I think uh, we can safely call the FDR here father of digital revolution in, in India. No, of course it is. <laughs> but, but at the same time, uh, when we are here, and I think I should answer the question that uh, Rohini Ma'am also asked, how can we contribute? Because there's so much that India has done. I think we should all feel proud of it and, and, and not call out that, okay, there is still traffic, there is still uh, uh, potholes, there is still lacunas or their shortcomings in India. And I think that's the contribution that we can do. Uh, that's where I, I come to the question that I wanted to answer, uh, get an answer that. <clears throat> how can we market what's there in India? How can we take it forward? How can we make uh, the world realize that uh, India is, uh, is, is not what you think it is. It is what it will be and it is today also. 
No, I think uh, definitely a lot more has to be done. But I, I must say it's happening. And uh, I think uh, this year, I think with India's presidency of the G20, you will see a lot more of that. And uh, we, we have found that when we actually showcase some of these things to global people, they are quite astonished by the change that has happened. Uh, and uh, I think there will be a lot of visitors from around the world in the next year to for the G20 meetings. And I'm sure that, you know, we'll showcase, India will showcase some of this to them. But I think the, 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 the wind is turning. I mean, I, I can sense it because I have a simple thing. Uh, I, I know the traffic of global visitors to India because they call me to give a talk to them. So I suddenly find my email is full of this board, global board is coming or that global board is coming. So I know that something has happened and maybe it's geopolitics, maybe it's China plus one, I don't know what it is. But suddenly, you know, I think India has got huge amount of uh, traction. I found that even today at the Blue Mark. So I think, I think the, the thing has shifted now. It's just a question of leveraging it and, and pushing it forward. Thank you. I'm just going to ask the next speaker to just, a uh, questioner to just give your name and ask the question, please. Otherwise, we'll be here forever. So, thanks, Rahul. Yeah. Hi, my name is Rahul here. Uh, I'm, I'm Bangalore 2015. My question, I have two questions. One is about Aadhaar. So when you created Aadhaar, you said that it is something which proves you are who you say you are. And it's exactly that. It, was that a conscious thing to make it like that? Because here in Singapore, we have NRIC, which comes in various colors. Whereas in India, the criterion was as long as you're resident, not citizen, resident of India. That means if you are a Pakistani living for more than six months in India, you can get one. So was that a conscious thing? And the second question was is regards to, with regards to election. So uh, as Indians, we like to say that the biggest problem in India is politicians. Yet when there are technocrats like you who want to change the system, we don't send you to parliament. So where do you think the problem is? No, I don't think it's a problem. I, I dodged a bullet when I lost the election. So <laughs> uh, I, I think the thing, see, what are the challenge in India is we had millions of people with no documentation, right? Because the birth registration was not that robust, especially in earlier years. And in many states, more than half the babies born did not have any birth certificate. And in, in the Western world and in, probably even in Singapore, the birth certificate is your root document. That's the proof of citizenship and so on. Now, what do you do in a country where few hundred million people have no document to prove who they are? So we had to create a starting point. And we had to also make sure that it was a unique identity. Because birth certificate is unique. You only get it once. But how do you make, how do you do uniqueness at, in a, in, a, in a situation where half the people don't have any documents, which is why we said we'll use biometric deduplication. And there was no way of ascertaining the status of the person. So we said we will distinguish a foundational, uh, foundational ID from the applied ID. And so ID says Ashok is Ashok. So the Ashok, this is a passport. The Ministry of External Affairs will decide. Where Ashok is a taxpayer, the finance ministry will decide. Whether Ashok can, should get a driver's license, the road guys will decide. Whether Ashok can vote, the election commission will decide. Whether Ashok is a citizen, the home ministry will decide. So we deliberately unbundle the foundational ID from the applied ID. Because if you get to the applied ID space, it ain't going to happen. So we had to unbundle it and make this ubiquitous. And then everybody at their pace applied it to their use case. So this is actually a conceptual point that how do you separate saying who he is from what he can do or what he's eligible for. Thank you. I think there's one question at the back and then there's two there. So we just finished that. Um, again, keep it. Good. Just ask. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Hi, my name is Krish. Did not go to IAM. Uh, I run a startup. I, I also didn't go to IAM. Yeah, <laughs> makes clearly the same boat. Not a founder, so maybe one day, yeah, you know, we'll get there as well. So thank you so much for speaking. I wanted a very sharp uh, question. We spent a lot of time talking about the concept, the ID, how we separated foundational ID from applied ID. But like all founders, we all know execution is everything, right? So how did you execute so fast? What or so well? What were some of the th key things that you did that made you 
able to execute such a complex project so well? Well, we basically built uh, on the technology, uh, technology side, we built a system that could scale very rapidly. So we built it to handle one and a half million enrollments a day. Uh, and uh, we uh, designed it so that there could be any number of enrollment points and it would have no impact on anybody. Basically, it was, uh, you know, it could scale infinitely in that sense. And uh, we created a market mechanism for yeah, enrollment. So instead of the historical model would have been government would buy the hardware and set up the thing. We said, no, we'll use a market mechanism. So we created a whole set of enrollment agencies and paid them, you know, say 50, initially 50 rupees per person to do the Aadhaar enrollment. So they invested in the CapEx. And so we, so we conducted a CapEx model to an OpEx model. Now what happened with that is that because they bought the hardware, then they had to do a lot of enrollments to justify that investment in capital, right? To get better asset utilization. And to make sure they didn't game the system, we only paid for a successful Aadhaar. If you enrolled the same person twice, then you didn't get it because you would get rejected. And the rejection was handled by a backend biometric deduplication engine, uh, which could uh, do a billion people's uh, deduplication. That is also a big technical issue. So, for example, if we had 500 million people in our database and 1 million new people joined, we had to do 500 trillion matches by to reject, reject a person or not. So that was a massive. So combination of complex, te sophisticated technology, the back end and simplicity at the front end, uh, and a market uh, OPEX model of payment, created an engine to do one and a half million a day. We have a question in the back. Yes. Okay, maybe I'll just speak up. Same Gautam who asked her a question. No, no. Two different. Two different Gautam. Yeah, this Gautam's all backbenchers, right? Yeah. All backbenchers in the back. Oh, Gautam. Huh? Similarity ends there, but uh, <laughs> uh, so just uh, changing subjects a little bit. As somebody who's passionate uh, about solving big problems, what are your views on climate change, and what are some of the more impactful ways, if you were to solve this problem, what were the, some of the big silver bullets you see? And as a follow-up to that, where do you think the imp uh, there's more impact? I is it in terms of policy and governments coming together and solving the problem, or where there's so much policy paralysis and all these, you, you have these conventions and then you know there's only one weak link and it collapses, or is it informed citizens and corporations? Where do you see the biggest impact in this? I think climate is probably the most complex thing to solve and uh, I mean, there's policy, there's markets, there's technology innovation, you know, there's there's change management from hydrocarbons to renewables, all that. But let me give you my philosophy of impact. I have a two by two matrix, which I think all IIM chaps will appreciate. So on one axis, it's low impact, high impact. On the other axis, it's low resistance, high resistance. So I focus on that quadrant which is high impact and low resistance for anything I take up. Because that way, I can get impact, but the likelihood of it becoming derailed is the least. So climate, for me, is high impact and high resistance. So it's not a sector, I mean, not that I, where I want to be spending my time on. But if within that I do find a high impact, low resistance quadrants thing, I'll work on that. I know it sounds very like a but that's what I am. Uh, thank you very much, Nandan. We're going to have Rohini and Sonia to come back up on stage. We're going to do a joint session, but thank you very much. For you. So, uh, when we start the section, uh, Rohini, I wanted to answer a question of yours that you asked about what we're doing out here. Uh, and I think it's the, the lady. Uh, Rohini. The lady is in the center always. Okay. Yes. So I just wanted to share with you something uh, about what we had done. You asked about what we're doing. And I think the IM alumni, I think something we're particularly proud of during the COVID time, uh, the entire community got together. Uh, and we not only raised money, we raised about $6 million, but we actually said, we are managers. If anybody has money, 
we help source oxygen concentrators, tanks, plants from all over the world, certified them in all those countries and we shipped them in. And we ended up, uh, and I really think it's the entire community effort. Uh, we, dollars and, uh, we actually got the president of Singapore gave us an award for being actually a contributor to the, to the Red Cross. Wow. And the second one that I think you've tried to do with the High Commission, I know is particularly proud of is the work they're trying to do. I don't think they made it yet is migrant workers in Singapore. They largely come from the subcontinent, but they have a, a different and a typical type. So we're trying to see how we can improve that thing. So we're trying to do our own bit from out here. It's a question that you asked, so I thought we should uh, kind of do. But I have a question for the audience before that. There is a bottle of wine. You cannot look at your phones. For those of you who know the answer, how many of you attended the quiz that we conducted two weeks ago? A few, okay, it wasn't asked the quiz. If anybody can answer, first hand up gives me the quick answer, bottle of wine. How and where did Rohini meet Nandan? Uh -huh. Okay, the gentleman at the back. Yeah. Sorry? <laughs> Quiz in Ayurveda. There you go. Yeah. Got the bottle of wine. Well. Uh, you don't get it because it was at my wonderful college, better college than IIT <laughs> Elphinstone oh, College, Elfinston, Mumbai. Elphinstone, that's right. <laughs> Sorry okay, so, about that. So to warm us up again, I mean, what an incredible couple. They make it look so easy. They wear their success so lightly. It could not have been easy. So please tell us, what is your no-fail pick-me-up? Together, you mean? Oh, it doesn't have to be. You go to the forest, you told us. I go to the forest. <laughs> Nandan, what do you do? No, no, no. What is your look? I enjoy the time she goes to the forest. <laughs> yeah, absence makes the heart, you know. What is the best Actually, we don't, advice? we don't do this in public much. Because who knows, we don't start World War III by mistake. We don't <laughs> talk together in public very much. So, so tread carefully. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we'll keep it simple. What is the best advice each of you individually has received over the years? I think look forward. At least my I mean, don't ruminate or brood on the past. Just look forward. Um, I think uh, uh, trust in Samaj. Many of my mentors have shown the way. Trust in the people. Work with the people, trust in the people. Okay, I like how he's, <laughs> he's handing over. Back to you. Yeah. He's empowering you. Yeah, totally. I'm feeling totally yeah. empowered. When Nandan delegates uh, yes. stuff in the house to me, he calls it empowerment. <laughs> <laughs> chairman, chairman and CEO, right? Chairman and CEO. So uh, I was going to say, go ahead. Any prime, prime ministerial uh, sons-in-law, daughters-in-law on the way? Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. I was going to ask, you know, um, you all both have busy lives. Nandan has a lot of time. We know he has 26 hours in the day. He doesn't watch cricket or Bollywood, right? So you have a lot of time. But on a more serious note, what are your traditions as a family? So, uh, you know, though none of us are... I try to keep some rituals going in the family, very simple things that all of us do together. Um, and I think that's very important. They're very small, um, but they're sacrosanct. And my son is an atheist, so it's very hard to get him to do some of those. But uh, we sometimes are able to get him to stand on the outer rim yeah. and do something. So I think vacations, we do and family then we vacations. We do vacations together, but we also do a lot of discussion at the dinner table, and I think that's very important. Sometimes it becomes a little aggressive because all of us have very different, strong views. But it's important because that's when we connect. But vacations are great. Does the audience have any questions for them? As a, there are some, several couples who have yeah. come, so you guys should have questions. Yes. Um, yeah, okay, it's working. Hi, Nandan. Hi, Rohini. It's um, uh, I'm Amit Gupta. I'm the president for Thai. I'm an entrepreneur. Um, first of all, Rohini, I think you totally outshined everyone on this. Yeah, I, and don't say that. No, no, really. I, 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 I mean, he's 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 had his tough moments. He lost an election, so it's okay. You can deal with this. Um, Nandan, I have a question for you because you know, Rohini, you mentioned people, right? I'm an entrepreneur, um, and you know, when I think about your 42-year journey with your co-founders, you started with nothing, and you've built this. 
I just want to understand how has that relationship evolved and you know, what do you talk about with your co-founders? How do you spend time with them? Yeah, actually, uh, this is a great question. I think we've all grown old together in some sense and that's been a great journey. Uh, and uh, just a few months back, we actually hosted a dinner for all our co-founders and their families. And we did not discuss a word of business. It's all about our lives, our kids, and, and so on. And uh, very shortly, we're going to have a big event to celebrate four decades of Infosys with everybody there. So I think uh, we have come to a very good position where uh, you know the management today is really not done. I mean, there's no founder in management. Uh, and I'm the last of the dinosaurs left. I'm the chairman. Uh, but I think uh, it's, it's a good place. I think we're all get along well together. That's great. Yeah, it's a remarkable camaraderie after. In, you don't see that very much in other companies, all the founders. And even the spouses, we all meet regularly uh, for lunches, dinners, not as often as we used to, but the connection is deep. Shobha. Something. You've become different in your journey till now. I think my case, I should have spent more time with my family when I, when I was in the company building phase. I think I was so obsessed with making the company work that I didn't spend as much time with her. She reminds me very often. It's true. Uh, the idea of Infosys was so much bigger than our personal lives. You know, so um, really none of those people had much time at home when the children were growing up. It's very true. Yeah, and I do remind him of it even today. Um, but uh, I still wouldn't change that. I mean, I reserve the right to complain now, <laughs> but I wouldn't change that because I don't think you'd get the infosys that you got without that sacrifice. And what would you have done differently in your case? Uh, Anand? Huh? No idea, Deepa, yeah, no idea. Yeah. Deepa? Uh, sir, you have built a legacy of a company. You are also investing in other companies. So what difference do you see, pros and cons, of uh, each type of company that you are helping to nurture? Well, you know, I think uh, to, to build a company today requires enormous energy and hard work and all that. And so I think it's really best left to younger people. But what, what you do have is if you've done a lot of things, then you do have a sense of judgment about what can be done, what can go wrong, how to look around the bend. So I think that's the value that I bring to many of the companies that uh, we invest in. Uh, and, that, and the entrepreneur finds that valuable because they, are, they have the drive and the enthusiasm, but sometimes you know, knowing where the potential next obstacle will come from requires some experience. So I think that's how I do it. And, but I, 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 it's not just companies I invest in. I, uh, I'm quite open with, in fact, she spent, she said I spend more time helping young entrepreneurs than helping in the house, which is a fact. Uh, so, but I think, uh, so I generally try to create a climate because I'm, I truly believe that uh, the Indian startup ecosystem will bring about huge change in the next decade. He also has this uncanny ability to know where the puck is going to land, right? So, like all some of those investments you're doing all seem to have this Good trajectory where they're going to land into a better place in the future. Like the really so after years. <laughs> He's trying no, to no. make up everybody says you are better than me, so he's trying to make me feel better. No, no, no. I'm the president of your international fan club. Okay, Anand and then uh, hi, this is Anand. Uh, uh, unfortunately I am alumnus. Uh, I got offered twice by Infosys and didn't take it in the past. Regret that. Uh, to one question to each of you. Uh, you mentioned your two by two on where you chose areas for impact. Um, uh, so to Rohini, the question is you mentioned a lot of your philanthropic work goes into environment, which is really high impact and uh, high risk, right? High resistance. Uh, high resistance. Um, so just wanted to understand a little bit about that. And probably question to both of you is if you look at India's context, what do you think are the top three or four high resistance, high impact challenges that somebody needs to address, whether Sarkar or Samaj or uh, Bazaar or some combination of those? 
Well, I think obviously environment is a big thing. Social cohesion, I think, is a big thing. Uh, we we and uh, and I think uh, uh, creating equitable growth, which is a big thing. Where I think the resistance is less. The question is how to do it. Well, there are many areas which are quite untouched, uh, where government is also struggling, and where markets have no role to play, and where Samaj has not risen up. Just things like mental health, solid waste management. I mean, there are so many things like that that still need a lot of work to be done. And our opportunity is waiting for anybody in this room to start working on, because even if you begin small, it needs to be begun. So lots of things like that. No, if you if you are a problem solver, India is a great place to be. <laughs> like being in a not, super, not only supermarket of, of problem. Lots of problems, but also a lot of talent and willingness to solve them. It's the best combination. Hang on, we're gonna take two last questions because we are literally at the time of this. One from Shilpi and one from the gentleman there. Yep. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and it was really a lovely, you know, discussion that we had. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. My question to you, Nandan, is that, you know, as we grow up, we have role models and, you know, they inspire us. In your lives, you know, who were your role models and, you know, how did they inspire you? Well, I think obviously, you know, as I said, my father was a Fabian socialist. He was an agnostic. My uncle was a Royist. I know, you know, M. N. Roy. Radical humanist. Radical, Radical humanist was an atheist. So I think... They shaped a lot of my thinking when I grew up. I think Mr. Murthy is a great role model for me as he was the, you know, the, the lead founder of Infosys, Nelson Mandela on a political stage. So I think it's, uh, I'm quite, that way I'm quite greedy. Whenever I meet someone, I try to extract something out of that in terms of what can I learn from the way they do things, which I can. So I keep relentlessly absorbing stuff. Thank you. Thank you. And there's one from the... Thank you. Uh, hi, Nandan, Roini, ma'am. Uh, Sonia and Suresh, thank you so much for having Nandan and uh, Roini here and having such an engaging conversation. Uh, I am C batch of 2009 and a proud Infosion. Uh, I must call this out that I was rejected by, uh, I, I failed the Infosys test in 2003 when I got out of engineering, but I made it to IAM Calcutta. Uh, and we <laughs> I had to call that out. Uh, well, different skill set. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, Nandan, you, you, Rohini, you spoke about trust. And, and as Infosians, we have grown up with an old adage, I think, which is attributed to uh, an RN sir, uh, that in God we trust, everyone else comes with data. <laughs> uh, and there are so many more of these that we, we use every day as we go about our daily jobs as Infosians. Uh, Nandan, you as uh, not only as our uh, one of our founders, our ex CEO, our chairman now, but also a mentor to so many startups. Uh, one of the areas that we are very proud as Infosions is uh, our um, our ethics, our value to governance, our uh, uh, our very deeply rooted corporate governance, and being very clean on our on our financial statements. Across the world today, in the entrepreneurial and startup ecosystem, we see creative accounting practices, this run for valuation, uh, what would your advice be uh, as we chart the next 10 years of the startup journey? And how actively do you uh, engage with your uh, ecosystem to, to uh, the, the balance between evaluation sure. game versus the governance game? Yeah, well, I think, uh, I mean, in, in fairness, I, I do meet a lot of startups who don't do those things. So I think what happens in this world is that the few guys who flame out get all the all the press and so on. So you think that. So I think the level of this is as much as, as any other industry in the world. Uh, but I I have found one thing that we you know we only look at companies or individuals who pass that bar and that's that is actually the number one thing. You know, forget about the business model, business plan, all that is fine. But do they have the stuff to uh, you know hang in there and also whether they you know, appreciate that building a great company is not a, it's not a nine day thing. It's, it's, a, it's a lifetime thing. So, and there are many people who, who do that. So I think it's just a question of sifting through all of them to get to the right guys. Yeah, Nandan and the founders always used to talk about delayed gratification. Don't expect instant rewards. Um, uh, have aim high and delayed gratification is, is something that you deal with. You don't try to bypass it. I think we 
all of us saw that in front of us. This is the point where you don't enjoy anything because they all delayed. <laughs> That is so true. That is so true. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I think it brings up a last question to a last question to the two of you. You made the pledge to give away fifty percent of your wealth. How early in the journey did you always know you're going to do it? How easy? How hard was it? It was very easy. I mean, look, I feel like you know when I was in IIT third year, second semester, I spent all my time playing flush. <laughs> you did? Yeah. I didn't tell you that, but. The things you have to discover. So, so oh, all yeah. all night I would play three cards, tin patta. You know, I don't know if you guys played any. So I, I would. Good at it. No, I'll tell you the story. <laughs> Listen, yeah. So at the beginning of the evening, I would have very few tokens. Because I want to bet after this. Then by midnight or one a.m., I would have lots of tokens or whatever money. <laughs> And by six a.m., I'd have lost it all. <laughs> so I feel I'm at that middle now. <laughs> So, as far as I'm concerned, I began with nothing. I end with nothing. Everything is fine. Yeah. No, it was quite easy because uh, I mean, what are we going to do with all this wealth? We care about. Don't we all want to belong to a society that we are happy to live in? And if that wealth can be used, even a little, in some small way, to achieve that, see, giving. Is the best gift you can give yourself, right? So, in some sense, it's just uh, um, we are all wired to give. It was easy to make that decision. To uh, uh, what was difficult was to join it and say it all publicly. It became very public. That is difficult because it's then it's put puts you out there. But we had no doubt whatsoever in our minds that in our lifetimes we want to give the bulk of our wealth away. No question. Thank you, and I think those are two wonderful. <laughs> Two wonderful thoughts to end the evening with. I started with nothing. I will go with nothing. And giving is the best gift you can give yourself. Thank you so much, Nandan and Roni. Thank you.